Good morning. Let's open with prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for the freedom we have to study your word and to worship you. Thank you for creation and the many things you give us. Thank you for coming to earth as Jesus Christ so you will experience what we go through each day. Thank you for Jesus' death and resurrection to give us eternal life. Thank you for the Holy Spirit which guides and empowers us in our day-to-day -day lives. Amen. Last week, we studied that because of Jesus' death and resurrection, sin has no dominion over us because we now live under grace instead of the law. Imagine that Jesus stayed on earth instead of ascending to heaven. His disciples, and if we went to Israel, we would be happy to see him face to face, even if just for a moment. But that's not what happened. Instead, he gave us the Holy Spirit as the third part of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit, which gives us freedom for the future, which is the title of our lesson today. In Ezekiel 36, 25 through 30, God bestows the spirit in us so that we will follow his decrees and be careful to obey his regulations. In Romans, we read that we have died to the law. However, we still have an inner struggle to obey. It seems that we know the right thing to do, but however, we seem to always seem to do the opposite. The good news is, there is no condemnation for higher for the heirs of Christ, which is it does give us true freedom. Betsy will now read our scripture today from Romans. Thank you. The lesson is from Romans 8, verses 18 through 30. I consider that the offerings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not in its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first, fir first fruits of the spirit. We groan inwardly while we wait for adoption the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we are saved. Now, hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God who searches the heart knows what is in the mind of the spirit because the spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he formed knew he destined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called and those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Okay, thanks, Betsy. Uh, 
That leads into the section that I have, which is the Holy Spirit and hope. Uh, I think today's lesson from the eighth chapter of Romans uh, is one of Paul's most powerful commentaries. Uh, I think it can be called the lesson of hope. Uh, I think we all have some idea of what, what hope is. It's an expectation for the future. Uh, Paul mentions the word hope six times in the scripture that Betsy just read to us. When I think of hope, I'm reminded of that hymn that we sing, which starts out, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ's righteousness. You know, in this passage, Paul mentions some pretty complex terms uh, in getting at what hope is. Uh, a few of those, we don't have time to talk about all of them, but a few of those are fruits of the Spirit, freedom from bondage, redemption, adoption, and I think one of the more difficult passages in the New Testament, which says all things work together for good for those people who love God and are called according to his purpose. So let's touch briefly on some of these. First, fruits of the Spirit. The Old Testament required the Israelites to bring the first fruit of the harvest as a sacrifice to him. Paul says that when we become Christians, we receive the first fruits of the Holy Spirit as it becomes a part of our life. Later on, when we are united with God, we experience the rest of the harvest, the rest of the fruits of the Spirit. We become redeemed at that time. Paul also says that the Holy Spirit in our lives helps us to pray. I hadn't really thought too much about that until I read this, but Paul is emphatic that when we have the Holy Spirit in our lives, we are able to pray because without the Holy Spirit, we become inadequate to communicate with God. You know, in the upper room, Jesus tells his disciples that the Holy Spirit is the advocate and that after he leaves them, it will be the Holy Spirit that will continue to be his presence with the disciples. Uh, we know that on Pentecost Day, that the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus' followers, and that was the coming of the Holy Spirit. Uh, nothing's really changed in over 2,000 years when you think about it. Right now, it's the Holy Spirit that connects each of us with Jesus and God. Another term that Paul described in defining Christians is that of adoption. Paul uses the adoption metaphor five times in the books of Romans, Galatians, and Ephesians. Uh, by accepting Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we are redeemed and adopted into God's family. Romans 8.23 makes clear that we are, we are rescued from bondage of the bondage of sin when we are adopted. And that a component, of our, a component of our adoption still lies in the future. While we wait on that moment with hope in our hearts, we depend on the Holy Spirit to help us in our weaknesses and to work for good in our lives. In verse 28, Paul states that we know that all things work for good for those who know God and are called to his purpose. We know that being a Christian uh, does not in any way protect us from strife. Christians are subjected to the same trials and tribulations that the rest of the world are. So what do you think Paul's saying? I've thought about this a lot. I believe what it means is that if we have faith in God, put our trust in God, that when bad things happen to us, as ultimately they will, our faith in God can strengthen us as we deal with our circumstances of life. Can you imagine not having God in your life when you have to rely on misfortunate events that occur to you? I sure can. 
I'm reminded by the hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. That's, that hymn was written by Horatio Spafford after his four daughters were drowned in an Atlantic crossing to Europe in 1873. And as he was on the ship out in the ocean going to Europe to claim their bodies, he penned the words, when peace like a river attendeth my soul, when sorrows like a sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. So we'll now go to Barbara, who will talk to us about God's empowering presence in our lives. Thank you. It seems this must be, since it's the time of the year between Easter and Pentecost Sunday, it seems like a lot of devotions have been talking about the Holy Spirit. And um, one of the ones I read each day is called, uh, said it provides encouragement. In fact, the word come from a word which means encouragement. And it's also called our helper. And it one sums it up as being empowered by the Holy Spirit to walk in spiritual freedom, which is kind of what we're talking about today. Like Jack mentioned, Jesus tells the disciples that he will return to them in the person of the Holy Spirit. He also told them that since they had seen him, they had always also seen the Father. Through the Holy Spirit, the triune God is both present with us and in us. I have to admit that I really didn't understand the Holy Spirit too much when I was a lot younger. I really thought it was something to do with the Pentecostal church and the talking in tongues and you would hear people say, I got the Holy Spirit and so forth. But when a former pastor, probably my twin, late twin, his early 30s said the following Sunday was Pentecostal Sunday, I thought, ooh, I bet need to find a reason not to go because I'm Presbyterian. <laughs> but I, be, I went and began to, my limited understanding of the Holy Spirit. God uses the Holy Spirit to empower us in many ways. He may use it to guide us to some area of ministry, to help someone in need, or even something as simple as sending a card. The book of Acts describes how the Spirit led the disciples to new places give them boldness and powerful words as they preach the gospel. Paul describes the spiritual gifts of the spirit given to believers as well as the character that comes from the spirit's work in us. In Romans 8, 18, Paul compares our groaning and suffering of the present time to labor pains, such as the mother's labor pains results in a wonderful baby or waiting and groaning points to the moment when we will attain the full freedom as adopted children of God. We, as human beings, suffer all so often, whether it be pain, economic loneliness, but in the midst of the groaning, the Holy Spirit not only reminds us that God's presence is with us, but it also is God's presence with us. It it is the sweet fruit of harvest that will be much bigger later. God is present with us now, but later when all creation is completely set free, the real harvest of God's presence will be with us. Because God is with us now, we wait patiently for God's future when we will be completely free. As Jack talked about the Romans 8, 28, that's always been one of my baby, uh, favorite Bible verses. It assures us that all things work together for good and that we have been chosen by God. As well as the Holy Spirit letting us know when we have not done something we should have or have done something we shouldn't have, he also helps us in our pain and sadness by empowering us to live in hope and remember God's goodness to us. He helps us to experience the first fruits of our adoption as God's children and the freedom that comes with our adoption. The Holy Spirit provides our freedom for the future because he is always with us. And then I'm going to end with one of the devotions I liked about the Spirit. John 14, 26, Jesus calls the Holy Spirit the helper. 
This helper is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. And he is with the, you and with us to help us when we are discouraged, disappointed, overwhelmed, anxious, stressed, lonely, grieving. He is with us to give us faith, hope, peace, patience, wisdom, and strength. And as Jack mentioned, it was in this devotion also, he even prays for us according to the Romans, Romans 8, 26. But the Spirit himself speaks to God for us, even begs God for us with deep feelings that words cannot explain. Great. That's good. Thank you. Betsy is now going to talk to us about stepping into the world. When you are struggling, go to Romans 8. Life sometimes brings difficulties which cause us to groan. How do we add and help us to have hope? Our scripture tells us that all things work together for good. Remember, God has chosen us. And that choice involves our being brought into God's family and transformed into the image of Jesus. The Holy Spirit's work in our lives lies behind every component of comfort we receive from the truths found in Romans 8. As Paul learned 2,000 years ago, we know today the Holy Spirit works in our hearts and minds and brings us hope despite pain and suffering. We find joy in our adoption into God's family and our transformation into Jesus' image. The Holy Spirit intercedes for us in our pain, sorrow, and struggles. Because of the Holy Spirit, we are able to hope. We can move forward. We are free to hope. And we can put our whole trust in God and wait patiently for his will to be accomplished. You are not alone. The Holy Spirit intercedes for you. Thank you, Betsy. Let us close this session with prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we bring to a close again this week our study of your word. We uh, pray that uh, our minds have been energized and encouraged about this lesson about hope. We pray for those people who are hurting in our sphere of influence. May you give them peace and compassion as you deal with them in their lives. We certainly pray for the people in Ukraine and the suffering they're going through and that some resolution can be brought about that will end this terrible conflict. We pray for your church. We pray for the church everywhere universal. We pray for the church Waverly Road, our own church. Let us be a beacon in Kingsport uh, of your word. We pray for all of those people who do not know you, that as we move forward with our mission work and as we represent you individually in our society, that we may speak of the love of Christ that wants to come into every person's life if only they will let him in. Go with us now until we come back again next week for the study of your word. For we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 See everybody next week on Friday. Have a great week. Okay.